go. Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to our open board call. Um, I wanted to give you a quick overview. I think we're going to focus mostly on the citizen help desks in this call. Uh, but let me give you a quick update on what we've been doing globally and a couple of things that I'm seeing and thinking about. Um, I was in New York last week for the uh, UN General Assembly. And um, you may have read about, about what was going on there, but uh, one of the impressions I had is that this, this work that we're doing on accountability <laughs> is more uh, prescient, more important, and more uh, sort of at the top of the agenda than I think it's ever been. There was tons and tons of discussion about accountability. Uh, how do we build it? How do we engage young people? in it? How do we make governments more transparent? How do we bring the private sector into thinking about uh, accountability? And so that reaffirmed for me why what we're doing is so important and, uh, and really, you know, we're, we're at the cutting edge here and, and it's an issue that's at the heart of, of development. So I just wanted to, um, to reiterate to you guys, because sometimes I think it can feel when you're you know, when you're working on, on the ground doing the hard stuff, that maybe it's somehow disconnected from, from other things that are being discussed at the global level. But I think it's the opposite. We're really, we're really at the heart of things. And that's why this is so important. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Uh, so keep, keep it up because we're, you know, we're really changing the global conversation on this stuff. And everything that you're learning is allowing, allowing all of us and all of to, to tell people in power uh, how things should be different. Um, so that relates to the second point I wanted to make, which is that um, I think we need to uh, continue to think about and get better at being an advocacy organization. Um, we do a lot of very good good things, practical things on the ground. You, you know all about, about those because you're running them. Um, but like I said, I think we're, we're learning lessons from that, and those are very valuable lessons to advocate for policy changes uh, and for for new laws and new ways of approaching things from the top down. So, um, so let's continue to think about that. Uh, I know you're doing it often at the local and the national level in your countries and even at the international level through the Open Government Partnership or other initiatives like that. But let's continue to find opportunities to, to advocate for what we're doing, to advocate for accountability, to push for different ways of of engaging people and young people in particular in in conversations about these sorts of things. Um, the third thing, moving sort of a bit more towards our internal issues, the third thing I wanted to mention that I'm thinking about is our growth uh, as an organisation. We've grown very quickly, as you as you know. We're now I think nearly sixty people around the world, um, and that comes with its with its own challenges. Uh, and so we need to recognize those and really focus as we grow on the management and on the communication around what we, around what we do, because we're a different organization now, even to, to the one we were six months or a year ago. So even, even for those of you who joined recently, uh, things, are, things are changing quickly. Um, so, so let's really continue to communicate. Let's share our successes internally. Let's make sure we all know what we're doing. Across, across the whole world because we really are global now. Um, and, it's, and it's important and, and fun and I think encouraging to see what, what each of our teams are, are doing. Um, so continue to, to share that we're part of a movement um, here and, and we need to remember, to remember that, but also just practically on the management side to get everything done um, is a challenge. And these are often you know, difficult circumstances that you're working in and you're doing an amazing amazing job um, but that's why we need systems we need processes we need timelines uh, you know this isn't this isn't just about imagining the change that we want to see it's about really putting in place the mechanisms to to achieve it um, and then the other part of growth is uh, as we discussed last time possibly moving into new contexts and so I wanted to let you know that I'm going to Mexico um, week after next because they're very interested in running Integrity Idol in Mexico, which would be very exciting. It's a big country, it's very strategic. It would be our first country in Latin America, of course. And, and so there's a lot that, that I can learn and that they can learn from all of your experiences with Integrity Idol. So if there's anything you think about that you think I should know or 
things that you'd like to see included in Mexico that perhaps you haven't had the chance to implement yet, let me know because I'm, I'm going down there for about four days to talk to everybody and try and set up the partnerships uh, and, and get that going. And it'll start in January, so it won't be this, this year in Tegucigalpa, Idol, it'll be next year. But we found an amazing young woman there called Eva who's going to help us do this. And she's, she's a campaigner and an activist and is really fun and very well connected. So I think we're in a really good position. And as soon as we get things going properly, we'll introduce you to, to her and I'll give you an update on Integrity Idol. Um, and uh, yes, and then the final thing I wanted to say is that we here in DC uh, with Jean and, and Sherry in particular, and then this weekend with Fayaz as well, we're trying to develop a new theory of change for, for the Accountability Lab. Um, the theory of change, is, as you know, is a way of explaining simply what we do and, and why it matters and what the impact is, which, which we already have, but I think it's a little bit outdated and given everything that's going on, we want to rethink it. So we're gonna spend some time really thinking that through and brainstorming around it. Um, and so we'll, we'll, once we've come up with a draft, we'll send that to you. Of course, we want your input and your support and your buy-in for it because this is a shared theory of change. Um, and so we'll be in touch soon about, about that. Okay, so now I'm gonna hand it back to- Me, quickly. To Jean, uh, and we're gonna talk about the help desks. Well, no, I'm not gonna talk about help desks yet. I'm talking about a few operations things just to remember. Okay. We're coming towards the end of the year, final board calls for the year, everyone. Make sure that you have your board meetings. Um, we, it's usually an audit requirement that you have four, at least four board meetings a year and it's coming towards the end of the year and so it's important that we get those done and that we're not rushing them. Budgets, I've spoken to some of you about budgets. Uh, we're going to try and nail down the rest of the budgets. You'll see that it's really, really important in most of the new proposals that we're handing in that people are asking us for a global budget. Um, and that's very difficult when some of the money comes directly to certain country teams. Um, and then I don't know what's happening. So thank you so much to those of you that all participated in the past performance. That was a massive undertaking. Um, but good news, we've done almost 100 projects in the last six years. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So that's huge. What's, what's the overall amount of money that we have spent? So uh, almost 7.1 million, I think. Wow. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty impressive. Please use the past performance document if you need, to, need it. Um, carry on updating it. It's really, really, really important. I was in an organization that tried to backwards do 10 years worth of past performance, and it was a nightmare. So now we actually have it. Um, keep it updated, please use it. Please don't lose it in the sense that somebody tried to change some of the numbers the other day. <laughs> so I've locked the form. If you want to make changes, let me know. Um, and those are the few things that I wanted to talk about. So um, here is one thing that whatever project we do, at least one report needs to be submitted to the donor, the final yes. report. Yes. If only we can compile those reports, like put all those reports into one place, If you, even if you want to do it 10 years down the line, it'll be on our fingertips. So we can Send do it Send them to me, period. please. I already have that folder. Awesome. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, Stephanie, take it away. Stephanie, this month is managing this, the call. Um, and we're going to ask a new staff member every month to handle the call and collect all the information. So Stephanie is our girl this month. Hi everyone, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, so just quickly to go through the rest of the agenda, I'll go over the overview of Citizen Help Desks uh, for those that don't know, and then we'll have a brief touch on the toolkit modules, which some of you have been part of, participated in, um, or maybe are looking to use in the upcoming months. And then we'll have country perspectives of those of you that are running citizen help desks in your country, as well as looking to start. Um, and then quickly open up to questions and an open discussion. So um, just to recap, I think Jean has set aside, is it five minutes for each country team? Is that correct? Um, yeah, as quick as possible, we're, we are stopping at quarter two for questions hard. There's a hard stop at quarter two for questions, so please do keep it quiet, keep it quick. Yeah. So with that in mind, every country has already submitted their um, and so we really don't need an overview of what Citizen Help Desk is for you. We'll just touch on what you submitted, which is your themes, your successes, 
your challenges and then your next steps. Um, so with that, for those that don't know, Citizen Help Desk is both a feedback mechanism and a community trust platform. Um, it's something that we've been working on in Nepal since 2015, and it's now expanded to two more countries, starting in Pakistan now in a few months as well. Um, right now, we're at an interesting point looking back codifying the process, seeing what are the different challenges. Um, yeah, if everyone could just maybe for videos, that would be helpful. Um, anyway, so now we're just kind of looking back at the program overall and how it's different from country to country. What are the core elements of the model um, and what are the kind of common challenges that we can work on and apply lessons learned um, across countries. So just to briefly go through this cycle, of course it starts with listening, uh, working with community through community frontline associates or community agents to listen and gather feedback from citizens. Um, that collection process takes place through one-on-one -on -one meetings, town hall community meetings, um, group meetings, special interest groups from youth to gender to um, full range of different community organizations. And that's collected both through Facebook interactions as well as with Kobo Toolbox, which many of you are familiar with. Um, and then from there, that goes to the citizen help desk teams that are based within each of the um, accountability labs, who then analyze that data, synthesize that information, and fact check either with government agencies or the other different stakeholders, um, in Liberia's case, mining companies. From there, um, maybe the most important step is closing the feedback loop, so disseminating that information that we gather from those reports and sharing that through radio programs, monthly bulletins, quarterly surveys, um, making it digestible through infographics, conveying that information in the local vernacular, um, and really sending that back into the communities so that that last step of action can take place. Problem solving, influencing policy decisions at the local and national level, um, and ultimately, hopefully, building trust among the community. Um, the toolkit, I think, uh, so Nepal is very familiar, and now Liberia and Mali have gotten to participate as well. Um, basically what this is, is a codification process, so looking at how we built the Citizen Help Desk in Nepal and how that's taken form in different ways in Liberia and Mali, um, seeking to understand, like I mentioned before, the different challenges, um, gender, sustainability, are we really listening to the people that we're intending to listen to, um, how are we collecting data, and of course how we could be better just taking on the mindset of a learning organization. So basically the toolkit modules are thematic. There's about eight different modules right now. And then our plan is to have both an online as well as in-person format um, that internally I think is something that Pakistan, Nigeria, South Africa can use as you're building out your own help desk programs. Um, but externally, a lot of different organizations from UN agencies to local NGOs are interested in the Citizen Help Desk platform and they want to implement it within their own organizations. So this is an opportunity potentially with some sort of revenue involved for us to share these learnings with them and um, perhaps even consult with them as they get it started within their own organizations. I'll just pause there and let uh, Sherry or Blair add anything to the toolkit modules if you'd like. Yeah, and Jean, anything Jean, to add? Jean and Fayaz are here as well. Um, uh, I would say that, yeah, the, the plan is to make these really interactive modules. Um, so this, this isn't just a written set of materials that are going to be online that no one is going to read. Uh, we are really hoping that they're going to be fun, interactive, there's some, some videos involved, um, you know, lots of good graphics, really making this something that, that people can use um, so, that, so that they can learn from this and so that it actually uh, influences the way things get, get done. 
Yeah. And I yeah. think just maybe one thing to add there is, <clears throat> since we've been working on this, I've made it a point to when engaging with other organizations, getting a sense of whether this is a useful tool for them. And as you're engaging with maybe partners on the ground, um, not necessarily explaining that, you know, we're putting this out in X amount of time, but getting a sense of who would find this useful, because as we're still working on the training, etc., it's good to know who the end user ultimately is going to be and how we package it in a way that's useful to those people. Yeah. So in terms of timeline, we're looking at um, end of October as sort of a soft launch. Um, we've shared the draft with a few different people. Um, we're working on finalizing that. And then hopefully by end of this year, if not beginning of next year, having some sort of online course version available. Um, so I can share that with everyone uh, by the end of this week. Um, I'll go into Nepal now. So we'll have the citizen help desk manager or associate presenting their um, slides that they submitted. So Sneha, do you want to go ahead with Nepal, please? Hello? Hello? Yes. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Have you got it on two different programs? You might be oh. Hello, everyone. Hello. We've got two people logged in the same program. Yes, yeah, so you'll have to come in from one phone, please, or one computer. Uh, hello, everyone. Greetings from Nepal, and uh, I'm Sneha Rizal. Uh, an associate supporting uh, Citizen Help Desk program in Nepal. Uh, and like uh, to start with, I'd like to highlight the main activities that we do uh, around CSD, uh, town meetings, community meetings, uh, daily interaction, um, case referrals, radio surveys, videos, uh, other main activities that we are mainly working around. And um, there's one more thing that I'd like to add on. Our resolution channel is um, um, something that we are working on to expand and work with in order to create this synergy effect in terms of impact. Uh, because there are a few organizations working around the same issue, we uh, we are working around the same issue, and then there are other organizations as well that uh, is mainly working around the same issue. So, um, uh, so we are just working with them in order to get. Uh, uh, proper impact, and we and of course, uh, considering the, the community people have really uh, benefited from the from from these sort of channels. And uh, speaking of intended themes for the future, uh, uh, in fact, we've already started working uh, around um, open local government, citizen participation, co-creation, and collaboration. Um, Sarah? Uh, speaking of challenges. Speaking of challenges, uh, getting trust amongst community people was um, a huge challenge in the case because uh, our employment issue was a very um, sensitive issue and community people wouldn't speak up. They wouldn't, um, our CFA was um, just an ordinary person and then they wouldn't know, uh, they wouldn't speak up to them, they wouldn't trust. Our CFA is where we have contacted where it was real trust. And next challenge, speaking of next challenges, working with local representatives was again another challenge. Uh, while in the initial phase, first century in attempting to convince the elected representatives uh, now has led to a big success. And um, speaking um, uh, work, while working with local representatives, you know, the foreign employment was uh, underrated, they were focused. They would, they would always focus on the hardware aspect rather than the uh, software aspect. I'm sorry. Um, uh, they would just focus on the uh, hardware aspect and they would just ignore the software aspect. They would just focus on roads, uh, building bridges, and we want to drive their attention towards working on um, uh, this issue as well. And then uh, another problem is uh, remotely, uh, like we've been uh, remotely mentoring our CFAs. Uh, since we are um, in sort of human resources, 
and we are just not able to go to the field. Field workers are working there and we are just working from office and um, we are not uh, being closely, we're not being able to closely monitor them, mentor them. They've been uh, coming up with few challenges and it's, uh, it's difficult for us to know what actually is happening in the field. And, uh, and, uh, and there, there, there's this uh, expectations from community people as well as uh, local government, community people. When we say that we are here to help you, they expect a lot, and then we have to again work. We have to again balance that. We have to balance their expectations. And again, when we say, to the, when we interact with the local government, that their expectation is again of a different level. Again, that is another challenge for us. And then, uh, speaking of uh, biggest success, uh, we just had uh, we just conducted two district level peer learning workshops, and we the looking at the um, number of participants, the it was overwhelming, and the participants were uh, like really excited to share their experience, their challenges, and their best practices. Uh, what like from this, what we got to know was. Um, the appetite for learning was uh, of different level and we are also hungry to learn, they are also hungry to learn, so that was uh, something that, um, that, was, uh, that, was, uh, that was something that we had, uh, we had, uh, we had tried to achieve and to, to some extent we were able to. And speaking of sustainability, we know that um, we, are, we are only a project and we may not we may not um, uh, remain. We, we may not be there forever. So, but the problem is going to be there, and we wanted the local representative to take the ownership. And um, uh, speaking of progress, budget budget allocation has been made um, from various municipalities to work around uh, foreign employment issue, formation of uh, regional environment workers committee at municipal level are some of the examples of our steps closer to collaborating with local representatives, and uh, then. Um, the repli uh, speaking of replicability, uh, heads of non-working areas have invited the CFAs to impl implement the TST model in their places too. So, like we've been getting demands from non-working areas as well. And uh, our CFAs, uh, another success, is our CFAs have just not been positioned as, a, as an ordinary uh, like representative of CSD. They are also positioned as point of contact for feedback and uh, resolution mechanism. Uh, one of our CFAs have been included in um, policy drafting committee, uh, considering the fact, considering the degree of um, degree of uh, their involvement in the community and the community perception of our CFA. They have uh, they have been invited in the policy drafting committee, which is again, which I would like to consider as a big big success. And speaking of next steps, uh, uh, we are about to con uh, we just finished conducting uh, uh, district level and municipal level workshop, and now we are heading towards conducting a central level peer learning workshop, um, engaging, um, engaging local representatives. And then we are also looking forward to co-create and design for feedback mechanism in its local government units. Uh, we, we are also collecting, uh, so we are also looking forward to collect and disseminate the final report that we are about to prepare on survey that we recently con uh, conducted around uh, foreign employment issues with returning migrant workers. And then uh, we are like very soon looking forward to launch the learning, TSD learning toolkit, which TSD just mentioned about. She has been working around, working on it since past few months and we are almost towards, it, towards the end. And, uh, CFA, uh, CFA Collectives uh, is another event that we are looking forward to. And we've always, uh, lately we've been focusing on uh, peer learning sessions. We, 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 we know the importance of um, in regard towards the end of our project. We want our CFAs to give their inputs, to give their feedback so that we can incorporate those feedbacks in our um, new CSD. Um, designing new CSD project. That's all. That's yes, perfect. Thank you, Sneha. Um, I just wanted to add too, so you guys had some really interesting research with MIT GovLab, mm -hmm. who the CHT did, um, and we will share some of their research in the upcoming weeks, but they were looking at the CHT model, what were some areas to improve, that sort of thing. 
Thank you. Do you guys just mind um, muting your video as I move now to Liberia? Hello, everyone. Uh, for Liberia, I think we we are on course, and uh, currently we are implementing a project called Building Better Governance in Mining Areas. Uh, as you know, our concession area are prone to violence. So we are operating in central Liberia and out of uh, Western Liberia. So with that, we've made significant uh, achievements. Now we are able to discuss with the company and they, try, they, they now appreciate our project. So some of the challenges we had over time have to do with uh, one staff turnover. So since the concession area is easier for people to leave the work and go for something with the comp to go with, with the company. So that we've experienced in uh, both Central and out of uh, Western Liberia. However, we've been able to engage the ones we got currently. It's like someone leaving and the next person who come in or take over, we have to train them and make them understand what we, what we do. The second one has to do with our environmental condition. Uh, now we are in rainy season, although the rainy season will soon be ending. But it has been somewhat challenging because of the bad rules. Leaving from like the, uh, from Monrovia to go to Bon County, Kokoya, is very terrible. Uh, but we keep engaging uh, the people from Kokoya in spite of uh, the challenge. Challenge has to do with uh, the rural condition. And the third one has to do with uh, absence of political actors. It's more like we invite them to our meeting, but the inner senate representatives. Is, uh, the locals say, where is our, our, our lawmaker? Where is our uh, uh, minister? So, so much challenging. And then I move next to the successes we've made over time. So as part of our, the successes, one, we've been able to engage and the company has seen the impact of our work. So the company, uh, Beer Mountain, is currently protecting the, like, the sign of water from spilling to water but the surrounding waters because there was an incident once that affected the community. And based on our work, it has also contributed to the establishment of a, a new clinic. And uh, over 200,000 units have been turned over to residents uh, who are resettled from the Okinjo. Okinjo is where the, co the company is currently operating uh, because at the time they found a gold deposit so they had to relocate the people. So as part of our the resettlement action plan, we had to build housing for people who, they, who resettled. Also, we experienced that uh, there have been rural improvement as compared to the first time we started in, in uh, August. It was very deplorable, um, but there have been significant improvement for Western Liberia. Employment too, there has also been significant improvement for, from the aspect of employment. It's like a company is giving the locals they changed the opportunity to work with them. At first, it was more like they were taking people from out of the country and uh, from central, uh, let's say, uh, Monrovia. But now they are engaging the community. People are living in the community and working with the company. And the other one to do with our education. For education, we started first. They, had a, they got a school there, which is a public school. Uh, but the company workers weren't really benefiting from uh, subsidies. But now the benefit from a subsidy 500 annually is like the maximum amount of number, num the maximum number of kids you have to present to the company is five. So every year for an employee, they give $500. Drinking water has improved significantly. At first, they have like three hand pumps functional, but for now, they can boost off over 10 hand pumps. And then I uh, don't have to do with a uh, provision of community solar light. Uh, this for uh, uh, central Liberia, uh, where MNG operates. So when we engage MNG, people were complaining about the MD and other things the company wasn't doing. But one thing we took notice is that they've been cooperative from uh, uh, central Liberia as compared to Western Liberia. So now they try giving all of the towns, the surrounding towns, solar light because one of uh, the main things they were complaining about that they need power. But now all of the towns surrounding, uh, most towns that are affected by the company's operation now boost of a uh, solar panel line. So the other one has to do with uh, the knowledge base. As part of our survey, what we do is to ascertain whether there has been an improvement about 
the MDA, whether more people can boast that they've heard about the MDA, or is bad. And so when we did our first survey for Beer Mountain, is like you have 54% in October, that's the time we funded our first survey. 54% knew about the MDA, meaning they have heard about the MDA. Uh, but currently we can boost of 97% of people who are living in these uh, affected community can boost that years ago they have heard about the MDA. And also not just looking at uh, the MDA, what they've heard about it. They also want to know whether they understand what they've heard about. And so we asked the question that I have to do with the action the company has taken. Uh, in October, it was at 52%, but currently is that the knowledge has improved to 87%. And the other one I have to do with a uh, fund paid. So we ask as to whether they know about what the company is supposed to pay. Because in our regular CSG bulletin, what we do is that we provide information about the company's operation, quote unquote, uh, the mineral development agreement, and also the resettlement action plan. And so when we conducted the first survey, it was at 4%. People were saying, oh, the company is supposed to do this. Uh, but this number improved from 4% to 85% in our last survey in August. So that is for the sources we've made over time. And then I, the next one I have to do if I, just to add on to this, I think there have been an establishment of the union group. So when we started first, there was nothing like a union group in Beer Mountain, neither uh, uh, Western Agro MNG, where they operate. And so based on our engagement now, Beer Mountain, the, the employees, they got a workers union that is functional. They got a grievance committee in terms of any problem. You can channel your, your, your grievances through them. And uh, our next step is like we, got a, we, will, we will be wrapping up so enough in November, the Building Better Governance Project. And so our next line I didn't have to do with I, we still have two multiple stakeholder, multi-stakeholder dialogue to conduct. So one is in Western Liberia and we got the other one in uh, Central Liberia. Followed by that, we got a film festival. So what we did was, was more like a storytelling. We engaged our stakeholders from our stakeholder based on our stakeholder mapping. The company were able to talk with them. We talk with our uh, locals. We talk to some people who own uh, many drug stores to know about what do they feel about health. Because we have five cardinal topics which have to do with our uh, health, education, housing, water supply, and other uh, pollution. And so since we conducted the interview, we are currently working on uh, the production. After that, we will be going to do a film festival. And so. This is where I stop. I think my team members might got something to add just in case. <laughs> yeah, if there's time anyway. <laughs> yeah. So that is it for like you. I just wanted to add, um, also really interesting with the mining project here in Liberia, they have a few accountpreneurs. So just something to think about within your own country teams. How can we um, maybe work with one funder on a project but incorporate different parts? So having Film festival and an accountpreneur working on the issue, and Citizen Helped Us all together. Um, now we'll move to Molly. Jean, do we have anyone from Molly on the call? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, sorry. Um, so I am with Suleiman Bore and the Citizen Help, uh, Help Desk Officer, uh, Daman Pupana here. So I'm going to uh, try to translate yeah, the text in English. Um, Perfect. Yes. So the main challenge we face uh, in Mali when we do the survey is uh, the security challenge uh, due to this, um, the terrorism um, uh, in the northern part, in the middle part of Mali. So, uh, the second challenge we face is um, to most of them uh, the lack of opportunity of job for youth. And the third problem is mainly the corruption uh, of public servants uh, in their local community. 
uh, yeah, that's only, from, that's basically the three uh, challenge we face when we, when we made the first um, citizen help desk um, survey in, uh, in Mali. And the impact um, we can have, because uh, this is the first round, uh, the first experience of citizen help desk in Mali, uh, the, the impact we, we are waiting for is that we can share the data with donors in order to design some new program uh, um, on job creation, um, corruption, uh, fighting uh, in the communities, and also um, helping uh, the administration in the local uh, part of Mali to, to establish some solution uh, to protect uh, people in their communities. Uh, the second uh, impact we can look for is to restore confidence uh, between uh, citizens and authorities in order to, to build a community um, that can be growth. And the third impact we can look for is to assist the authorities, uh, the public servant, uh, in local communities to, uh, in their decision making, to help them uh, to implement a project that can respond to the needs of the communities um, based on our survey. So the next step, uh, because this is our first experience, the next step, step is to go back to the communities, discuss with them, and also trying to see if there is um, some improvement um, uh, in the communities um, in youth employment, corruption, and also uh, security challenge. So the next thing is also, uh, is basically that, going back to the communities and also establish partnership with NGOs and local authorities to try to uh, get things done and also, uh, yeah, uh, Try to prove, uh, to find solution yeah, to the problem in the communities. Yeah, that's basically uh, what you can say. I don't know if Suleiman can, Suleiman and Daman can speak in French, and I can translate. Uh, yeah, if there is some part that I have missed, I think because I'm not. A good, yeah, a really good overview of everything. Thank you so much for that. I just wanted to make a note. Um, so we will have questions and discussion at the end. So if anyone has any questions, please just write them down and we'll get to them at the end so we can have a good discussion. But thank you for that. Um, now on to Pakistan, please. Do we have Fayaz? Sherry, are you guys still on the call? Unmute. We're just unmuting. Sorry. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, I think they, yeah. All right. So um, we haven't started, you know, formally the citizen help desks in Pakistan. This is something which is still in the pipeline. We are speaking to um, both the uh, United Nations, which is a key partner in Pakistan for citizen help desks, and um, we were also speaking to the government of Balochistan that thought that they needed an initiative which can help build um, trust between um, the, the, the government of Balochistan and local communities over there. Uh, Balochistan has its own unique context. Of course, it's, it's a relatively less developed area uh, of the country. Uh, geographically speaking, it's about 44, 45% of the country but housed to only 5% of the population. And it has its, its own set of challenges, which are, um, you know, um, more similar to, to the challenges that we have in African, you know, offices, African countries. Um, and most of all, you know, security challenges there. Um, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's that. We, uh, you know, this is perhaps one of the reasons why I'm here at the Feedback Lab summits, you know, some of the challenges that we anticipate to face in, in that community. Uh, we had put forth, you know, put them in front of the kind of sort of in, intellectual community over here and tried to pick their brains on that. Um, that's that. Uh, so far, I mean, the UN has, UN and the Balochistan government has already dedicated a budget for that. Uh, 
um, the the only th- and they they I mean the government of Balochistan have to do it because you know because of this this huge uh, road and infrastructure project is going on on in there with with support from China and uh, um, so it's it's only a matter of time you know we we might start working on it in two months and we might or we might start working on that in maybe four to five months uh, it's it's just in planning phase some of the questions uh, you know I know Stephanie can share. Uh, the um, Stephanie, can you can you can you move down on on the on the presentation? Yeah. So, yeah, so the, the, these these are, your questions the, these, well. are, the, these are particularly you know the questions to which we are trying to see can answer. Uh, and I understand that many of the colleagues uh, who are working in African countries they might uh, see some synergies in the context or some similarities in the context which is here in Pakistan or in their communities and probably may be able to you know kind of advise us on how to move forward in this kind of context that's all from my end great thank you yeah I've um copied all the questions and we'll have them again at the end thank you for submitting them okay so so coming soon, um, Faith, do you want to lead us into discussion on how this might look in South Africa? So I'm going to be leading on this one. Faith is, um, Faith can't chat today, um, but I think her face is there. <laughs> um, so just to what we're thinking about in South Africa is an option around looking at closing feedback loops and building accountability amongst um, young women with the idea that eventually we would like to start talking about gender-based violence, which is um, an enormous problem in South Africa. Um, if you can move to the next slide. There we go. So this is sort of what we're thinking about doing. Um, we're looking at how to get a better understanding of, of the environment that we're going to be working in, building the right partnerships, and then hopefully the idea would be to link um, the media with, uh, with service providers, government and citizens in one space to be able to address the issues and the challenges that women, fa or that, that women face, whether it be around um, sort of gender-based violence or whether it be around financial inclusion, because I think that many of these issues are so tied to each other. Sherry has is, is, um, been accepted to a fellowship where she's going to be doing some thinking, a sort of high level thinking around what this may look like because it's such a very, very, um, very complex issue, but also a very sensitive issue. We're going to try and work on it with just starting with two communities in South Africa, um, and looking at how we can tell good stories and tell the right stories and connect women with the right services um, so that they don't necessarily have to report to the police if they, they don't want to, but that they can still receive the services that they need um, after experiencing uh, some sort of, uh, sort of an incident of gender-based violence um, and, and many of the issues that sort of come around that. But if people have any questions, let me know. And we would be happy to chat um, chat further. This is still very much in its nascent phase, and we're going to be having some conversations in the coming weeks. Thanks, Jean. Do we have Ode or anyone from Nigeria on the call? Ode's yeah, here. I'm, yeah, I'm here. Um, you didn't submit any slides, but would you like to talk about how this would work in Nigeria quickly? I actually sent you a, um, a last an, a last minute email, which um, I, I probably I'm sure you didn't see it though. Okay, you'll have to just give me the points. Okay, let me just quickly pull out the emails. Um, so one of the things we basically are looking at from the Nigerian perspective is um, intercultural dialogues. Um, one of the things we have come to understand is Nigeria is quite. Um, diverse and um, we want to see how we can also use the citizen help desk to make people understand how they can live together. Um, recently we had the crisis in um, the northern axis. Well there's been crisis in the northeast but um, crisis keep erupting, keeps erupting in the northern part of the, the, the country and we are thinking um, one of the thoughts we have for citizen help desk is how can we get into the society to make them get information and make them understand why we need, need to live together live together as one and um, sorry just a minute I'm just trying to pull up the email I sent yeah 
So basically, we are looking at the broad. Um, I spoke to a couple of people, and we still think um, politics is an issue, um, governance is an issue, which we still have to get information and help people understand better. Um, I think a while ago we discussed on something that has to do with having the citizens help desk, like a mobile, uh, like a mobile app, where it can help um, our volunteers or people in the field to get information through the app, like a developed program which can collect this information. But we didn't even, at that point, we didn't understand how it works and the questions which are likely um, in the field. So that's um, about. That's uh, sorry. Um, the email is still popping up. Um, can we hear me, please? Sorry. I, I'm not sure if you can hear. Yeah, I can hear you. I think that's a good overview. Um, and I know okay. there's some other kind of to the citizen help desk in Nigeria, but are a bit more tech based. Um, but that's great. So first off, thank you everyone for sharing your perspectives and sending in your slides. Um, I, I think maybe we'll now open up for questions. Um, so I'd like to just kick it off starting with number two. So in a tribalist, caste-based, um, or maybe divided environment, how can we ensure that marginalized communities, especially women, are included in our feedback loop. Um, so I think everyone has this common issue of how are we um, listening to the community, to all the different groups. So if anyone would like to kind of talk about how your country in particular is paying attention to the different gender dynamics. Um, maybe that is training your CFAs on how to work with women. Um, maybe that's looking at the data a little bit better. Uh, feel free to share any insights. Hello? Yep. Hello. Can you hear me? This is Lawrence. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, excellent. Uh, I'm here with the, the whole team. Um, but I think that's great, great uh, point. Um, just to share a little bit of what we, we've done in country with um, our project, this one and also other projects, we really sensitive, especially our community justice project. One way we've tried to do it is to ensure that we have equal representation of women. One, we try to look at the communities, study, for example, one of the different traps that are in community and what's the level of engagement of young ladies as well as older and educated versus uneducated women. So in our Help Dex project, we ensure that when we put out the announcement, we were really key about I know, some selection. We want this number of female to come in. So when we went for the application, we encouraged more women by reaching to women groups because every community here has a women group. So I will also advise that there's a female group. If there is none, maybe you can try to establish one so that you can, because when all women are together, they can, they are free to talk, they can really relate. So across all of our projects, we ensure that women voices, another thing we're doing with iCampus is also on our internship, we say exclusively for females. So in our community justice project, we also have a disabled person that is leading one of the teams in Banga, so that the people that are, that are disabled can see that as a form of identity since they are marginalized group. I think that's a little bit I want to share. Maybe we can extend this via email as well. And uh, Fires, we can also have a conversation about it. Great. Does anyone else um, have a question? I'll, we have some here, but I can open it up for anyone else. Okay, so one that came up, I think, is this issue of CFA retention. How do we um, keep CFAs who uh, we spend a considerable amount of time training and investing time and energy into? Um, so I don't know if anyone from Nepal is still on the call, but 
Nepal team, would you like to share how you're looking at CFA trainings and how you've been able to motivate them? Yeah. We may have lost Nepal. I think they're there. I think they're just trying to get, here's Narayan. Oh, okay. Oh, there we go. Sorry, we are, we actually, we can hear you. We actually too many people, so it took some time to decide who who's going to answer that question. Uh, I think that's a very important question. And it's one of the challenges which we also discussed, which is, quite a frequent challenge on how to keep CFA motivated, uh, you know, uh, while working with us. But I mean, I don't know there's uh, a sort of any magic stick that I have at the moment, but what we do here is, you know, we try to find more incentive in terms of engaging them uh, more broadly than just doing uh, some of the activities that we, we, we prescribe them. So connect, connecting them with the local organization, connecting with our NGOs, inviting them here in Kathmandu. We, use, we do a, a frequent uh, meetup here, what we call CFA collectives, which we invite them here to discuss their challenges, listening their concerns, listening their issues, and also discussed among, uh, among all the CFAs and how to find all those uh, uh, how to find some some of the prob solutions of the problems that they're facing in everyday basic everyday basis collectively, and also we really encourage them to to help each other by connecting themselves, uh, uh, you know, in, in, among different districts, and also occasionally. I mean, we haven't done so much, but uh, we did last year a retreat, uh, you know, especially for the CFAs going going a retreat, staying overnight. Lots of fun, musics. Uh, those are also very, 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 very motivating factors. But then again, you know, the having the local, uh, you know, CFA uh, from the local communities is also makes sense in terms of retaining them as they are always from that communities and they also they wants to remain there. Uh, I mean, we have some issue with the CFA uh, turnover, but not really a high turnover. But again, I think this is something that we always need to keep in mind, how to boost the motivation of the CFA, creating more opportunity, training, networking, you know, fellowship, uh, connections, and, 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 and definitely a financial initiatives as well. Uh, Stephanie, if you allow me, I would also jump into a little bit on changing the name uh, from the CSD, you know, citizen address. Is the question is, is intent to know about what happened if we changed our uh, name, a branding, the citizen help desk itself, how it is understood by the communities. I think, I mean, it is well known, but however, we need to discuss about how to rebrand it and communicate with the people that we're working with and the stakeholders that we're working with. The more, the sooner we change uh, our name and create a new branding is better. Because, you know, I don't know in other countries, but in Nepal, citizen help desk is, is does, you know, it's too much of, you know, perceived as a as a physical help desk running by, uh, you know, government of governments and police and you know, different uh, rescue organizations. Uh, you know, in terms of providing uh, support immediately uh, after any sort of disaster, uh, and I think it it really depends on how we communicate with with the people that we work with. Uh, making sure that they don't, uh, you know, misunderstood the, the, the idea and the concept. Uh, is that the the question about? Yeah, that's great. A good point. Um, so if I understood correctly, Fayez, you're also looking at the name in Pakistan. Is that correct? Because there are physical help desks led by the government. Kind of supported Sorry, by the government. Go. Sorry, Sorry um, so the, these help desks are not led by the government. They are kind of supported by the government. We have larger political support for the initiative in the province. 
uh, the government otherwise is kind of on a receiving end. You know, they'll they'll be you know once we collect the data and consolidate it and you know um, trans you know transfer it to the um, infographics shape. Uh, whatever the feedback is, the government will you know of course learning from that will try to address as many. Issues.